sure that you have one. Let's talk a little bit about the author of First Peter. It's Peter, in case you didn't know that. And uh, let's learn a few things about him. His given name was Simon. It was later that Jesus gave him the name Peter. We'll talk about that in a little while. He was a fisherman. He was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and he moved to Capernaum with his brother Andrew, and that's where he met Jesus. He was a disciple, one of the 12 disciples. He was also called an apostle. Apostles are, are limited to the 12 and also those who are missionaries. Uh, Paul called himself an apostle. Barnabas was an apostle and others. And there are still Eastern religions today who call missionaries apostles. But basically the, po the apostles are focused primarily on the 12. He was a leader. Wherever you find the disciples listed in the Bible, his name always comes first. He was the leader of the crew. But he also was impulsive. He was impetuous. He was strong-willed. He often, often contradicted Jesus when he'd make a comment. He'd say, no, Lord, no, Lord, no, it's this way, Lord. He felt he knew better. He was self-confident. He would say to the Lord, I'm willing to die with you, die for you. I'm willing to do that. And a few minutes later, he denied him in a courtyard to a servant girl. He was prideful. He would say, we left everything for you, Lord. Or, don't wash my feet. And the Lord said, well, if I don't, you won't have. He said, then wash my whole body. He always was speaking quickly without, speaking quickly without thinking. So we might be able to relate to Peter. I think you can. He was really human. He's like us. Sometimes we think we know better than God. Sometimes we say that to God. I, no, Lord, it's, it's got to be this way. Is it really what you want, Lord? I think it should be this way. He's human, and he failed, and he was restored. Again, we can relate to that. So what are some things we can learn or we're going to learn from Peter in our series, The Want? Well, we're going to hear about living with and through suffering. We're going to hear it 15 times through that letter. And he used eight different Greek words to describe suffering. We're going to learn how to live victoriously in the midst of hostility without getting bitter. Well, that's hard. Live now as we wait for the coming of Christ. We're going to learn about God's foreknowledge and his election, our eternal inheritance, our responsibility to the government, marriage relationships, how to defend our faith, and how to have excellent behavior and how the word of God causes us to grow. So today's message is called One Hope, and it is going to be 1 Peter 1, 1 to 12, and I'd like to open up right away, and let's read verses 1 and 2. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago and his spirit has made you holy as a result. You have obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. So this is the audience that he was speaking to. He was speaking to Gentile believers in Asia Minor, and Asia Minor may, may sound familiar to you when we talked about the seven churches in Revelation. It's that same area, which is now modern-day Turkey. These were churches that were planted by Paul and Peter, and he is now sending these letters out to encourage them because they're receiving types of um, persecution. They're Roman provinces, and they are like the, the Israelites that were dispersed. Now, they've been dispersed from Rome, and they're in these different churches. These are set-up churches, and they are not, is not part yet of the ban of Christianity from Rome, but they're receiving slander, there are riots, there are local police actions, and there's social ostracism happening. And that's the suffering that they're going through. So if we want to start in your notes, we're going to look at the hope within the gospel in verse 3. And let's follow along in verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead 
now we live with great expectation. Other uh, translations say we have a living hope. But I want you to stick with great expectation. We have a great expectation. Now, I would like to ask you, if there's only one thing that you go home with today from this message, it is the gospel is foremost, paramount, and essential for everything in our lives. Let me say that again. The gospel is foremost, paramount, and essential for everything in our lives. Everything that I'm going to speak about and that Peter talks about in these 12 verses center around, are centered around that, are, are around that as its center. That's better. Peter, God is named Peter, because I remember I said to you that his name was Simon. It was funny, every time that Jesus had to address him for something he wasn't doing correctly, like a parent does to their child when they says their full name, Jesus would call him Simon. And then at other times when he was doing the right thing, he would say Peter. And that name comes from, if we look at Matthew 16, you might want to write this down. I was told last time I didn't tell everyone the... Uh, the passage, Matthew 16, 13 through 18, and it reads this way. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say that the son of, who do people say that the son of man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And then he asked them, well, but who do you say that I am? And immediately Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. And now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. But what I would like to tell you about Peter is, even though he is called Peter, Cephas, because it's a rock, if you really break that down, Jesus says, Simon, you are going to be called Peter, Petra, which is pebble. But on this rock, Petros, which is the statement he said, you are the son of the living God. That's what Jesus was going to build his church on. Not on the man, Peter. We'd all be in trouble if we built it on him. He's a fallible man. But on the statement that he made is what the church is built on. And so when we look at the hope within the gospel, the passage I opened with was the same Peter who failed, stumbled, he leaped before looking, he spoke without thinking, but he also learned from the master. He was forgiven. He was restored. He was redeemed. And so are we. We're fallible. We fail, but we're restored. We're redeemed. His message led that man who was fallible and who denied Jesus and abandoned him. And from the time that he runs out, we don't see him again. We know that he runs to the tomb. But when Jesus visits the disciples, you won't see any communication between Peter and Jesus. It's, Paul writes later that Peter and Jesus met, and that's where the forgiveness came. We know about the story that Peter goes back to his hometown, and he goes out fishing, and all of their other disciples are worried about him, so they decide to go with him. Well, I don't trip over this thing. I've stepped on it four times. All right. They were worried about him, so they all went out on the fishing boat. Now they're back to fishing, and he's just sitting on the, the sea there, must be looking out, remembering when he walked on the water and how Jesus called him out to walk on it, and he walked on it. And you know, when, when, you, when he started to look around, and he lost his faith, and then he started to sink, you don't just fall slowly when you're on water and you're not buoyant anymore. He had to drop like a stone, and Jesus had to grab him and bring him back to the... He had to be remembering all those things. And as the light came up, because they'd been out in the boat all night, there's a man fishing on the, on the beach, and it's Jesus. You don't know it's Jesus, and then... One of the others in the boat, I think it was John, said to Peter, that's our Lord. Well, Peter jumps out of the boat in about 
waist-high water and starts trying to run in the shore. The actual boat got in there before he did. It turns out it's Jesus. Jesus takes a walk with Peter, and he restores him. He asks him three times if he loves him. He says, tend my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, I do. Feed my lambs. And a third time says, do you love me? And he said, Lord, it, it really distressed him. He's being asked a third time. He said, Lord, you know that I do. He said, then feed my lambs. This was the restoration. And the three times are not a mistake. He denied him three times. The Lord is giving him a chance to also tell him how much he loves him. And the, the word love, we're not going to go into now, but it was a Greek word, and the Greek changed. Peter, we'll get into it another time. I could go right down a rabbit trail, so let's keep going. So he brought 3,000 people to know the souls. And it, it, the whole transformation of Peter was based on the gospel. And that's what I want you to hear today. That's what I said at the beginning. The gospel is the foremost, paramount, and essential for everything in our lives. Acts 4.12 is another time that Peter is speaking, and this is what he said. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among mankind by which we must be saved. That is the foundation. Saying what he learned. That is the foundation for our lives. Now, some of you may know I'm a bivocational pastor. I'm also an architect, and I will tell you that no building that I've ever drawn or it's been built that I had anything to do with is standing today if it didn't have a foundation. The foundation is the most important thing. You can make anything you want above that as long as that doesn't move. That's what holds it in place. Who knows about the Tower of Pisa? Many of you know about that. It's not an exceptionally well designed building but we all know about it because it leans and one day it will fall they had said it was going to fall they did some underpinning of it it's going to last now they're saying it's 2045 i believe is when they think it's going to fall but it's going to fall one day do you know why because it's set on marshy ground it doesn't have a firm foundation so at one point that's going to settle enough and it's going to fall or it happens to be a cafe right underneath it i hope they're sure about that date but in any case so our belief has to be based on God's truthfulness, on his grace, that foundation in our life. The gospel is that foundation. Now, it's one thing that I, I would like to stop for a second because we're talking about one hope. I want to kind of talk about the hope that we're talking about. When I say that we need to hope, I'm not saying that I hope the Eagles are going to win Sunday. That's not the kind of hope that I'm talking about. I hope I get a raise. I hope I get a promotion. I hope I get a favorable diagnosis from my doctor. I hope I get a call from my friend. You, you make it what it is. That's not the hope. That's the hope we use every day. You see the lights going behind you. I hope I don't get a ticket. Okay. The hope I'm talking about is not I hope so, I know so, based on what's happened before. All right, so that's how I want you to, that's what I want you to understand about the foundation. Gospel is foremost, paramount, and essential for everything in our lives. Let me read verse 3 again to you, that what Peter wrote. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's it, Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what our hope is in. And now we live with great expectation that is the hope that we want to have so what's your foundation what what is your foundation what are you anchored to what keeps you from falling over is it the gospel message do you allow the things in your life the circumstances that are going on to take your focus off that foundation can you be blown off that foundation titus 3 7 says because of his grace he made us right in his sight and he gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Looking to the future with a confident hope of what we know is going to happen based on what has already happened. What has already happened? Jesus died for us. He rose again from the dead and we have the promise of eternity with God. Let's go on. Point two, the hope within the inheritance 
the gospel message and the expectations of things to come include the inheritance that we're going to get. Let's read verses 4 and 5. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Stored up for us in the air. Do you realize that you're an heir of God's? Do you understand that you are, have been adopted, that you're sons and daughters of Almighty God, the one that created the universe? Does that sink in? Do you believe that? Because you are. When you accept Christ and the Holy Spirit indwells you, you automatically are part of his family. He calls you his child. We've been adopted into his family. And with that comes all the rights and privileges of an heir of God. We should have a confident expectation. You're going to hear me say this all over and over again. We have a confident, we should have a confident expectation that our inheritance is safe and protected. 2 Timothy 4.8 says, And now the prize awaits me, the, the crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Do you look forward to his appearing? Because what's promised you that is that because he was a righteous judge on that day of his return, that prize is waiting for you. That is what your hope is in. That is what you're looking forward to. As we remain patient, our inheritance waits for us. It's based on God's truthfulness. We can believe what he said. Because if you don't, you don't have anything to, to set as your foundation. You must believe that God is who he is and that he will keep his promises. Because that's what his promises is. It, our foundation needs to be founded in the grace of God, the work on the cross, his promises, and the fact that we've been adopted. But the problem is, we still need to live in a fallen world. So we're citizens of heaven. We still have to live in this world for now. Romans 8, 17 says, For since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share in that glory, we must also share his suffering. Peter was restored and learned what it meant to fail and to get back up. And he now encourages us not to do the same. He wants us to hold on to our hope, to have a confident assurance based on the sacrifice of Jesus, the gospel, the promises of God, our inheritance. And when we go through trials and hardships, suffering and persecution, we will come out stronger on the other side. The hope Within the fires, point three. Let's read verses six through seven. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world <coughs> second corinthians 4:16 says therefore we do not lose heart but though our outer person is decaying yet our inner person is being renewed day by day for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison so you may say to me, well, I have this faith. Yes, I look forward to what God has. My foundation is that, but man, I just got my feet knocked out from underneath me and I've hit the ground. This doesn't feel like a momentary light affliction. And I look around and many of my friends 
are not suffering with momentary light afflictions. Well, I think we all could feel that way. I think we all could feel like it's not really a momentary light affliction. And we, any of us would like to avoid it, right, and get out of it. But when we compare whatever you're going through right now, have going through, or what you will be going through before you receive that gift from God when you, he either returns or you go home to heaven, what is that compared to eternity? How do you see that as compared to eternity? In the light of eternity, the joy that awaits is far greater, is inexpressible. Do you feel that? Do you know that? Do you understand that? We can live now on a confident expectation of the eternal weight of glory that awaits us. Let's look at point four. You love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious and inexpressible joy. Can you say that about yourself? That even though I don't see God, I believe in him and I have a joy about that. That's hard. When we can't see something, it's even harder. But you know, the definition of faith is believing without seeing. And so if we look at that, our hope is based on the work of God through Jesus. Again, our inheritance the promises of the victory over our circumstances, and this strengthens our faith. Our faith is believing without seeing. The hope is not, I hope so. It is, I know so. Even though I can't see it now, I believe it, and the expectation leads to inexpressible joy, a joy of knowing it is true and will happen. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we live by believing and not seeing. We live by believing and not seeing. You know, we wouldn't need hope if we could see it. You don't have to hope in something you already have. You already have it. It's there. Why would you hope that you're going to have it? When we get to heaven and we have these, the, the inexpressible joy and all the things that are waiting for us, we don't have to hope anymore that we're going to get there. The whole point of hoping is something we don't yet have. But we believe with our faith, even though we can't see it, that we're going to have it. If we look at, if we look at Romans 8.24, it says, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already, ha already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, through perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. So hope by definition is an act done without yet having that expectation happen. But this confident expectation requires trust, requires faith. And also we should therefore have an assurance which leads to salvation. You turn the page, the top of the last page in point five, the hope of our salvation. Let's look at verses nine through 12. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. Gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time our situation or situation, the spirit of Christ within them, was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. You get that? The angels in heaven are looking down and watching, watching how you're living your life, what you're basing your foundation on, what your view and hope for it is because they're watching how it all happens. The prophets who wrote the Old Testament, the, the prophets that God talked to, remember that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Prophets filled in much more. And when Jesus was here, all they had were Moses' the Pentateuch and the prophets. But the prophets were told when they were writing it, it isn't for you. It's for those living in the present church age. And we're living there, and we are, and we have our hope because of what happened before it. 
the crucifixion, and the resurrection. That's what our hope is in. That's why we're there, and the hope is for this. What is to come? What is to come? That's what our hope is in. We have an expectant hope. We have a hope that we can believe in. All these things lead and contribute to our salvation. How we live now, how we trust, obey, grow in our knowledge and our faith, all contribute to our eternity. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. A friend of mine, a uh, pastor, uh, did a message on this at one point, and he tried to illustrate what our limited lives, which are but a breath, a blink of an eye, compared to eternity, looked like physically. So he had a ship's rope that was about an inch and a half in diameter. It was yellow, and it, had, it was yards and yards of it. He had it coiled up here on the stage, and then he took the very end, and he just tipped the end of it in, in black. He said, this little black portion is what your life is as compared to eternity. So we are going through things now. We do suffer. We do go through trials. We, even though they don't feel momentary, in relationship to eternity, they are. What is your foundation? What is your hope based in? Time here is just a breath as compared to eternity. It's a blink of an eye to our future in heaven. What is your life compared to eternity? You can look at it. This is what my life is here and I'm pretty unhappy. I'm bitter. I don't like it. Or you can look at it as compared to, but this is what's coming. This is what, I should be doing it this way to your, to your right. I always do it backwards. But you get the point. What are you looking forward to based on what has happened already? Acts 10.43 says, He is the one all the prophets testified about saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. The prophets who God spoke to about his plans for redemption of mankind through the Messiah were not the intended recipients of the messages we were. It was for us that the entire scriptures were written so that we could believe and have a confident living hope of life forever with God. But you know, what do you do with that is up to you. What are you going to do with that? What is your hope? You know, it depends on your relationship with God through the salvation offered through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. That's the thing you have to look at. Where does your hope lie? Is it focused on your circumstances? Is it focused where you are? Or is it focused on eternity that you're headed to? I want to remind you of the words that we sang in the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Here's the, the trials. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. I remember what he did for me. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and my stay when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless because of his righteousness to stand before the throne if that doesn't move you if that doesn't help you understand who you are in Christ what you have because of that relationship with God that you are an heir you have been adopted you're his child. Now maybe you don't know this, maybe you're watching online, maybe you're in this room and you don't have this relationship, you don't have this hope, you are just mired down in your life. 
you're walking through the deep sand, walking through molasses, it just seems like a struggle every day. And you don't have this hope to get through that with. Well, here's what you need to understand. It's your sin that's cut you off from God. But not just you. Everyone sinned, and we all for, fall short of God's glorious standard. All of us. And unfortunately, there's a penalty for that. The wages of sin is death, but God in his graciousness, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So what does it take then to have that hope? It means you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and you believe. Have faith in what you can't see. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. I'm going to say a prayer in a minute. I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you don't have that hope, you don't have that relationship, to start one. But maybe you're in this room, you say, yeah, I know Jesus. I've been a Christian for years. I know the Bible back and forward. But you know what? I've lost my focus on that hope. I am mired down in what I'm dealing with. I'm, I'm looking at everything I'm in instead of where I'm supposed to be looking. Well, this is the time. What is your hope based on? Do you live in joy or are you living in despair? If you look at your life in comparison to eternity and the riches that are stored there in heaven, free from decay, nothing will happen to them. They're being kept safe because of your faith now. Then your life should be full of joy regardless of what your circumstances are. Do you see the trials of today in light of eternity? That's how you have to look at them. Compared to eternity, they don't compare. Whatever is happening now doesn't even compare to what we're going to have in eternity. If so, how does that affect the way you live and believe today? This challenge is in your notes. Please reread it this week when you're doing your devotions. Where do you stand? What is your rock? What is your foundation? Our living hope is grounded in Christ our Savior. It's a biblical hope, and it's a confident faith and expected trust and a firm assurance of God's saving work in Christ. Let's pray. Our dear spot, Heavenly Father, you've made such a beautiful way for us by sending your Son, who in obedience allowed sinful men to kill him, but it was your plan that he would rise again and that would be the final sacrifice necessary for us to come and live our lives with you in expectation of what you have for us into the future based on all you've done in the past. Lord, you know the hearts and minds of everyone in this room and if there's someone sitting here who does not know that, does not know you, hasn't accepted the grace that doesn't cost him anything but cost you everything, Lord, speak to him now. Open his heart and I'll pray this with you. Pray this with me. Jesus, Father God, I need you. I don't have a relationship with you. My life is a mess. I'm in a quandary. I'm full of sin. And Lord, I recognize that in order to have the hope of eternity with you, to be your child, to be an heir, to be, to a, to be a brother and sister, a son and a daughter with God and a sibling to Jesus, in order to do that, I need to accept the free gift that you gave me. Open the gift that's under the tree. That's what you, that's all I need to do. And I have to ex express with my mouth and I have to believe in my heart. And I do, Lord, I do. Show me how to live my life from this moment on. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Guide and direct. Take me away from the sin that I've been forgiven for. And help me move towards you. I pray this in Jesus' name. And believer, if you feel at this moment like you've lost sight of that hope, of that glorious, inexpressible joy that's awaiting us, change your focus, center it back on God, see your life in relationship to what eternity is and how it's just a moment in relation to, to forever. Lord, thank you for these words from Peter, the lessons that we learned today and we're going to learn through this series. We give you the praise, we give you the honor, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.